Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Austin B Media. I'm your host, Austin Belzer. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. My guest today is Jeremy Jimenez, who has written, <laughs> directed, produced, and acted in a variety of films such as Criminal Mind, Ship, The Oval, Welcome to Chippendales, The Upshaws, 911, and movies such as Single Black Female and Joe's College Road Trip, which we just talked about offline. So welcome, Jeremy. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. That's something new. I love the energy. So first, let's talk about, you sold one film to Lionsgate, I believe. So can you walk us through that journey of selling those features to Lionsgate without connection? Yeah, totally. It was actually my very start in the industry. And we were kind of punching above our weight, I feel like, when we made and sold those films, me and the director of, of both the films, Lee Chipola. It kind of was the start of my career. I, I started as an actor, got involved in some short film. I was in Florida actually working in the little m local Miami market, which had a lot of stuff going on, but it was very, very small. You know, it was very local. So we developed a working relationship off of a couple projects. We did like a 48-hour film contest kind of thing, and he invited me to help write with him because we collaborated really well. And that experience went really well, made a very cool little short, powerless, about the power going out during a hurricane in Florida. It was a lot of fun. Flashbacks to Iraq war vet dealing with that. But anyway, jumping ahead, yeah, we from there we decided to, well, I was in his next feature as an actor and I helped co-produce. And then we decided to make our own feature together that we co-wrote and then he directed and we produced together and so these two films the, the first one that he directed was a two thousand dollar budget and then the second one was 15 split three ways me and him and our third producer who's also the cinematographer it was like a joint venture between the three of us we went all in you know we put some money on credit cards we're like here's five thousand let's make this thing and it was about an aspiring music rap artist in the Florida scene, and he was becoming famous. So it's kind of funny, subject matter, really small film, you'd think you would do the opposite. But we knew a lot of people down there, we knew a lot of locations, and we had a lot of great actor friends. And our DP was one of our producers, so he just obviously brought in so much gear that we went for it. And, you know, our big thing was that we were playing above scale in terms of the production value. It was a, a really, I mean, 15 K is tiny budget, but we were well, going to try to, like, <laughs> it's not even a budget. It's nothing. Yeah. But you know, everybody at that level is inspired by like Robert Rodriguez and you know, what do you have and what are those materials and what are you capable of pulling off? What are your special skills? So we, we had a blast making the film it was my first feature and was all a whirlwind. We got access to a concert venue and we had a real concert basically that we shot and stuff like that, you know, helped us pull it off. Anyway, when we finished the films, again, I was just starting my career. So obviously as an actor, I knew I needed to come to LA to try to take the next step. You know, that can be scary. I'd been procrastinating for a while. Like, do I have enough credits? Do I have enough experience? When is the time right? But these two films were finished and nobody was going to sell them unless somebody stepped up especially at that time less online you know, this is years ago it's you want to be pounding the pavement so to speak so i moved to la had these two films and then trying to get established here and, and get used to the terrain as an actor and just get my life going i was basically just hitting up every producer's rep every acquisitioner uh just just <laughs> off of like the manual looking up the books who these people are and cold calling and learning. I mean, I didn't know anything. I didn't have any mentor. I had no mentors in the industry and I had no background, no friends, nothing, but I didn't know any better. So it was also the kind of like the power of ignorance, you know, I had nothing to lose. So I just was calling people and we ended up finding Seth Kate, it was producer's rep and he'd been at it very successfully for many years. And he had a lot of built-in contacts at a lot of these places, but particularly Lionsgate. Them both being somewhat genre films. The other film was a kickboxing film. 
he was able to kind of make that introduction there and they you know they loved the film both films right away and 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 made us an offer for a two picture deal you know they wanted both films and so they acquired both films off of us and all of a sudden i was in la within the first year and had two lionsgate films sold it was really cool yeah and i want to go back to that low budget aspect because i don't think people realize how small 15k is in the realm of producing you know from budget you're talking about m a you're talking about marketing advertising production pre-production post right yeah from pre to post the entire scope deliverables included so yeah but certainly not even a, a realistic practical model to be like this is you know uh, i i do think obviously today as people talk a lot about there's way more different avenues that you can make a film with with your iPhones and putting lenses on. But even that is in, still insane. What we were doing at that point was uh, we were shooting on an HVX, a Panasonic HVX. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the advent of the digital revolution, you know? And so we were in many ways, I, I think we were kind of on the forefront to doing it. But yeah, with just tapes, you know, it wasn't even cards then. So, so but at the same time, those were, Pretty, those are cheap cameras. We didn't pay for those cameras. Our DP had them. Our director was the editor. He handled all of post. I mean, he did yeoman's work. He did it. What he did for that film was really, really special. I mean, I re really admire what he pulled off and the stress he endured, especially in deliverables when he wanted us to help with a lot of things, but he had all the assets essentially and so was responsible for doing all that. But I guess what I'm saying is a, a lot of the ways around it were that it, it, we had we were able to pull off so many of the positions with one person, with uh, three people, but covering all different parts of it. And then also, like I was kind of alluding to before, our, our DP had been working in Miami for many years at that point, but he had never DP to feature. So he was looking for that opportunity to showcase something for himself to step up. He had a ton of favors that were ready to be pulled, but he hadn't pulled any of them because he wanted to save them for the right project. He loved our script. That's where I'll give ourselves credit is that he really wanted to make this film because he really believed in it. And he was willing to give all those favors to us because he thought it deserved it. But also he wanted to do it for himself. He actually sort of pushed us to make the film because there was a point about a month or two before we started making it, that me and the director were, well, you go to these meetings with different people, line producers, UPMs, even when you go to investors, and all of a sudden you're getting all this information off of what you're trying to pull off and the reality of filmmaking and them telling you that it's unattainable. So we had started pushing back, like maybe let's push back, let's try to get a real budget, yada, yada, yada. And he gave us this feet to the fire speech where he said, hey, you could do that, and we could wait three to five years to get the real budget, the 1.5 that this thing needs to really make it. And maybe we'll make it then. Or we could go right now with this amazing script that you guys made with all the gear that I can pull off with all these favors that we have. We can make an awesome version of it for where we're at right now. That's going to set us up to make another film and then another film in three to five years where then we'll have a lot more reputation and then we can make that. So. I think it was a combination of people believing in the script, believing in the project, pulling a lot of favors, being able to do a lot of different jobs and just going for it, not worrying about it not being done right, you know, just doing it. Yeah. And, and I guess my point with that was to put it in perspective, I believe the John Cassavetes Award for Film Independent is 500,000. And that's considered a microfilm. And I asked because, you know, budgets have, I would say, not even quadruple, but what, what would be the 100 times that? So yeah, hearing 15,000 is, is is unfathomable to me, but I'm so grateful that you, you were able to pull it off. And with such a big studio like Lionsgate, I mean, even now they're really not, you know, they've released a few indie movies like, the first one's coming to mind, maybe because I saw a TikTok clip of it last night. Uh, Arkansas came out four years ago, I believe. And that was, I want to say a million, two, three, maybe more. But 
probably because of Vince Vaughn. But tangent aside, I do want to talk kind of, let's see, how do I want to approach this? I guess what challenges, well, I guess we already talked about the challenges of making a low-budget film, so I think we can move on to the next section, yeah? Because yeah. I think that first answer kind of answered two sections worth of stuff, so I don't want to, like, restate things. Elaborate. No, that's... You're great. I love when an interviewee talks more than I do. That's like the gold standard for me. So I'll just move on to the Danny Glover thing. So on the opposite end of that, you produced a movie with Danny Glover. I forget the name of it off the top of my head. The, the Shift. Oh, that's right. I'm, so do you want to talk about working with him and how, how he impacted the project? Yeah, total. Just to set it up, that was a film where just kind of continuing with like the ethos of what I've done, the projects that have come up have been with people that I know really personally, most of the time have worked with maybe in other capacities and organically kind of built stories from that. The writer and lead actor star of this was uh, Leo Oliva. He was a, a great friend of mine and we went to two years of acting school together at Meisner. So we'd really been through the crucible of some really intense work where a lot of personal stuff comes up because that's what you're working through. And in doing that, we had end up having a lot of deep life talks and gotten to know each other on a deeper level. And, and that's story material. And particularly with him, he was an ER nurse. So he was burning the candle at both ends because he would work the night shift, work all through the night in the ER in these life or death situations, you know, really primal stuff that he's dealing with all the time. And then he'd come to class the next day and we had to rehearse three hours every single day. We were required to between class. So he'd finish up his shift he'd go straight to a rehearsal and he'd come to class and he just had this he's a very willful person just had a lot of spirit and a lot of drive and a lot of heart you know he dealt with a lot and he had a lot to share and so we start he wanted to make things he was driven to make things as well and i obviously had made already the the films Lionsgate films by then and i wanted to make more stuff and so we started talking about how this is a movie story what his life experience was as an er nurse and a, and a topic that he was really passionate about was end of life care and he just would see so many patients that were suffering and really didn't want to go on and he was navigating that uh philosophical issue every single day about what is right letting these people go or making them suffer and do you have the right to pull the plug and all of that and we just thought that that was a really worthy topic of exploration for a film so we ended up developing this story called being called the shift that essentially takes place you know, in somewhat real time, over the course of one night in the ER and the nurse, it's from the point of view of the nurse rather than the doctor or the patient this time and him dealing with patients who are at end of life care. And then, you know, somebody really spe special to him comes in that starts to bring up a lot of the stories from his own life that he hasn't dealt with as well. So it, it was a really poignant story and a really important message film. And again, we were doing this on a very minimal budget as well. Not quite as minimal as Know Thy Enemy, but we were around 50,000, I think, at, at the start of it. It might have gone up from there a bit, but it was a low budget thing. And, and so we were working, but one of the assets that we had was we were in an acting school together and we essentially had a built-in ensemble and it was kind of an ensemble piece besides the nurse being the lead because you're in a staff you're in a hospital with nurses and stuff and so that really really helped us a lot and we wanted to make it raw and real and we were able to work with the people that we knew who allowed us to get rid of a lot of the acting for it so that was great. And that was an amazing basis for it. We were really going for this kind of neorealism style, really into that at the time that you felt like you were just there, you know, but the one capper that we felt could take it to the next level was then having somebody, a name and a great actor that could 
bring some gravitas to it and help us push it to that next level, especially marketing wise and everything. And yeah, and we had this role of the senior nurse there who had been through everything and who just was a little bit of the omniscient eye that looked at things for what they were rather than having as much of a particular, you know, desire one way or another. And I mean, who better than Danny Glover, just with his presence, his voice, his eye, his history on the screen, all of our relationships to him in, in that way. It was really incredible to end up getting him. And, and again, that was one where we went through his representation and we were able to get the script to him. I think the script really drew him in it being an important movie for him, especially at that time. I know he was going through some personal things that I think he really related to it. And we were able to get him in. That was one of my first times working on set with a legendary actor. So there was, there was two things that I'll remember about it. One is just you feel a different sense of pressure and insecurity around them because they've seen it all sure. and you find you're judging yourself against the people that have directed or produced them. And you're like, yeah, what's this guy thinking of me right now? And you want to try to treat them with as much respect as possible and make the set really professional. And so you're on your piece and cue. You also, you know, like with anybody, any powerful person, if you treat them like with kid gloves, you're going to be being superficial to them. So you want to connect and it was a challenge, but it was awesome to get that experience. And then watching him. Uh, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing I can always say is uh, just when he was actually acting and you would look at the monitor, a lot of times you'd be, you'd look at him and then you'd look to the monitor and you'd feel like he was just not doing anything. He's just kind of sitting there and then you'd watch the monitor. And you'd, all these thoughts are coming out, all this behavior, all this, uh, well, the realities of the real life. You know, he's a great actor. And so yeah. he wasn't acting. And it was amazing, you know, and it was really, it was a great lesson for me, both as an actor and, and a director to see how little you kind of need to do as an actor, if you're really steeped in, in what you're doing and that the performance is there. I feel like he leveled up that film many times, both in terms of influencing us to be very professional when he was around, but then also just the performance that he brought to it. I felt like he upped the games of all the other actors around us too yeah and to key in on two things you talked about i was doing some research while you were talking and i was like well that came out in 2013 if i'm not mistaken the shift came out in 2013 which i feel like was kind of the start of the i don't want to call it the indian movie renaissance because that kind of seems disingenuous but that was the start of when you started to see people like not Joaquin Phoenix, Adrian Brody, Detachment, um, big stars coming to these in indie movies and really just saying, I want to do these smaller movies. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, Marvel obviously started kicking off probably, you know, I mean, a couple years before that, but in earnest sometime around then, right? So we start getting a lot more diversified set of feature. I mean, a lot, let's face it, a lot more smaller budgeted features and indie features. So I think that you start to get a little bit of a, a bifurcation of the big actors doing those huge films and then playing in the more indie water. I just think that's kind of, I don't know, I thought that was interesting. Let's talk about some of your other projects. I know uh, you just released a movie with Tyler Perry, one of his first, what, six Netflix movies on his output deal, Joe's College Road Trip. Yep. So can you talk about what that was like working with Tyler Perry? and you know, acting in that yeah i'd love to this is my second time working with tyler perry i was in his show the oval i had a four episode run a couple years ago and that was a lot of fun he works incredibly fast we were in and out i mean that's going to be the case for everybody but it all kind of happened in a blur and i was a lawyer you know in the white house the show's the oval but it was great to, to start with that. And what was cool with this one, like you said, he has a, a new deal with Netflix, I believe, for six or eight films. I'm not sure how many. I think this is the first one under that moniker that's coming out. So it was fun to, to be on the first wave of a new deal. Um, but what was really exciting about this film is it's a Medea film. And he wasn't in the ones that I did before. And not only is he in it, I, I end up acting with him in my scenes. I had a very fun role kind of classic Tyler Perry, you know, racial comment. I'm an insensitive, very entitled white guy who's his neighbor. And I think I'm his best friend. 
And so I treat him with some very crossing the line kind of commentary because I think it's cool, you know, we're bros and stuff like that. So he wanted me to, to just bring it and go as far as I could with all that stuff. He allows a lot of improv and you never know what you're going to get on, on the set with him because it's kind of like, you know, saddle up and just off to the races and phew, you're just shooting and whatever happens kind of is what it's going to be. So you want to be really prepared so that you can let it fly on the set. And yeah, we shot it. And I was like, like I said, my first time getting to act next to him. And again, obviously he's so multidimensional with what he does, but I tend to think his acting itself ultimately is the bedrock of everything that he's done in this career. Cause he's really a sensational actor. And I think people sometimes overlook that or forget that because he has so many aspects to it, but you feel it when you're acting with him, he's really present and really there. And there was a lot he was giving me and a, a lot to go off of. And um, yeah, we were just kind of shooting zingers at each other. He gave me a fun comment after we did the first take. He said, oh, you're throwing a bunch of zingers at me. And I was like, uh-oh, you know, see, did, did I go too far off script? It's like, I love it. Do that. Just, we're going to do one more. Just give me everything you got. I'm like, all right, sweet. This is great. So I think it'll probably be out there pretty quickly. Yeah. And I will say underrated. You know, we talked about uh, underrated acting of his. I'll always go to bat for his performance in Gone Girl. I think that was the one that made people think, oh, yeah, he could really, yeah, if, if uh, he ever wants to put Medea to bed metaphorically, so he could do his own, like, yeah. Watch, yeah. He's tremendous in Gone Girl. I had the same reaction watching him in that. I was like, oh, man, Tyler Perry is really good as an actor. Yeah. Who's, you know, when you separate him from the world of the stuff where he's doing this, the satire and the, and the sketch and just like, you know, just a regular old fashioned movie playing roles, like uh, he brought a lot to that. And yeah, it was a great movie, but yeah. And I'd be remiss to mention one of the projects that's in the top left corner of your Zoom screen that you recently released Final Heat. Could you tell us a bit about that film and what drew you to it? So. We had a world premiere screening of it on uh, Sunday night and it was a blast. So we made a bunch of posters and we gave a bunch to the cast and, you know, we're able to give something back. So I got mine here myself and it's, it's really, I'm proud of it. It's fun to have here and um, trying to figure out where to put it up in my place as a centerpiece. But yeah, your question was what drew me to it. Mm hmm. Again, I have the same themes over and over. It was an organic kind of thing. I, this was with another friend of mine. Um, we had started training in CrossFit, and we did that because we were initially together in a writing group for about 10 to 12 years with seven other people. There were nine of us. So we called ourselves the Nine Lives Writers Group. It, it was a really foundational piece of my early L.A. Uh, experience that just allowed you every single week to show up and meet with other writers and people trying to create stuff, produce stuff, and keep you on track, keep you accountable, keep you working, um, bounce things off of each other. Uh, I, I, if anybody's out there, that's one of the things I would probably recommend as a piece of advice I could give more than anything when you get started, get yourself in a writer's group or create one. I, I created this one just with the friends that I knew that were trying to write when we were starting out and just pulled together people that I knew and were like, let's try it. And then it ended up, like I said, lasting for, for so many years. It just gives you a way to start judging material, critiquing material, reading, diagnosing it, which obviously makes you a much better writer, but then also you're writing your own stuff and you're getting feedback from them and it's elevating and you're being held to higher standards and you're pushing yourself further. So that's a long notes about writer's group, but the, a lot of the stuff that I did for a long time ended up starting there and coming out of there. My partner on this film, Brad Benedict, also an actor, and we were together in the, the group for a while. We'd met through tennis. He was a college division one tennis player. So I played some professional tennis as well. We met on a set of a commercial for a NCAA tennis commercial and bonded right away over our love for tennis. So when we were starting to try to make material, we wanted to make something together. We wanted to make a tennis film and we started developing that. At that point, I had kind of been out, you know, once you play a sport at a high level or I think do anything and then you retire or walk away from it, you have a burnout of it for a while and you don't do it at all. So I hadn't been doing it for years and I hadn't been doing anything physical just because I wasn't excited about it. 
to make a long story short, to make this tennis movie, I wanted to get back in shape physically and then start training because I was going to act in it as well. He was a coach at this CrossFit gym and invited me to start training there. That would be a foray into making this project. We were training every day. At the beginning, it was super painful. I was super out of shape. I couldn't walk for days. The first time I, I went there, I couldn't do a squat, couldn't get into a full squat. We were making videos to kind of track our progress. I think he was just using it as an opportunity to embarrass me because I would do like two pull-ups and he was doing 55 and then we would post it. And it's like, oh yeah, progress video. But really it was just like, I couldn't do anything yet. But, you know, I improved. And anyway, I think we were showing up there every day. And, and before we knew it, it became kind of a staple of my life was this training regimen. And I started to feel different physically than started to feel different. And, and anyway, before I knew it, I just think that we were, the work we were doing in there was kind of changing us as people. And I, I felt like I was... Actually, the big thing, and, and this became a big theme of the movie, was sort of rediscovering. Well, first was being confronted in the pain of workouts with like reality. And that's the same thing with, for me, I want to do a lot of sports films. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is how they're revealing of our psychology and of character. Putting somebody yeah. under the microscope of really intense pressure reveals who you are. And sports is such a great vehicle for that and to break down our walls. So it, does, it works on two levels. It's revealing, but it also gives you a chance to grow and, and change. And then the third aspect was a, a sort of a rediscovery too, because for me, it rekindled these ideas of who I'd always been kind of growing up and into my early adulthood of being very aspirational and very motivated and hardworking and competitive and fierce. And it, it was hard to always... I grasp onto that when I was in LA because you know, you're trying to get auditions, you're trying to work, isn't that? But it, the entertainment industry can be so nebulous. It's not one step to the next. It's just sort of trying to create that path, but you don't have the control over that. And with sports, even though you don't always have the control over how great you can be and over the breaks of the game, you do have control over the work that you put in. So I loved that about it. And it, it, it reminded me of that. And I started to feel like myself more. And this was all story. This was all theme. We started talking about you know, why don't we make a story about this? And we wanted to try something different. We weren't going to do a feature because we we felt like in the gym, it was such an ensemble world. So many different people that we were interacting with. It was a TV type of thing. And, you know, NASA web series and stuff like that. We're like, why don't we try to make something at a high level, sort of a medium length type piece that's not a short, you know, two minute joke sketch and it's not a half hour pilot because we don't have the means to do that and where are we going to put that so what we ended up doing was we compromised in the middle we made about 10 minute episodes we wrote it in a, in a format that would be about 10 10 minute episodes it's feature length linear story but it was sort of over the course of a tv season and so we were doing these sort of big jumps in time as the team trains, it's set around this CrossFit, this husband and wife couple, their gym is kind of going under. They don't have the means to keep it going. So they try to put together a, a team to take to the games, to win the cash prize, to keep their gym afloat. And it's the ensemble of the team that we follow for the year. So we're doing these big kind of forward leaps in time throughout these seasons, but we have these 10 minute increment blocks of a linear story. And so that was kind of how we were a little bit looking to circumvent the problem of telling a big story that we were excited to tell with, with very small means and small funding. To fund it, we did crowdfunding, we did Indiegogo, which accounted for most of our budget. But anyway, when we finished it, we looked back and realized that the whole storyline was one story. It was a self-contained movie. So I, I re-edited it as a movie. But that was what I wanted to tell and how I got started in this film was just being in it and training with him and realizing that there's a lot that I'm going through that I want to express story-wise through this. Yeah, and I think that's the perfect use of the series where I think a lot of times I'll look at a series like, I'll just use, I guess we're bagging on Disney today, but um, like their Disney Plus originals feel like one big movie edited into a series, rather a ser uh, the story of a movie told through a series, if that makes sense. 
for prime example, Ahsoka, I feel like that could have been a nice, tight 90 minute movie. But now it's like a six hour epic Star Wars show that could have had half of it cut out of it. Right. And they're more of it. Go ahead. No, no, I haven't seen it. So I, I can't comment on that one. But that's interesting. I mean, I know they have so much, you hate to use the word content, but they have so yeah. much that they make, right? Fill up their coffers. Yeah, but yeah, I just wanted to comment that telling multiple stories is kind of my favorite type of TV, the utilization of TV, because I think it's utilizing the format well. You know, I'll see docuseries. The most egregious example is the new Steve Martin docuseries where I got a screener for it and I was like, oh, cool, I can't wait to cover it. And then it was like a two-parter docu-series. I was like, ah, I don't know about this. Episodes an hour. Yeah. I'm like, Uh, just make that a movie at that point. Ten, you know, ten-minute episodes. That that gels much more for me, format-wise. Because, yeah. It was an interesting thing for us. I I backdoored my way into this because it wasn't intentional. So I'm lucky. I don't want to take the credit for it. But... Sure. Because they were self-contained 10-minute pieces, each one is a little plot turn. Each one has a built-in tension and, and a rise and the stakes. And so it was kind of like, you know, I know Charles Dickens <laughs> used to write his novels this way in little pieces and then throw them together. But I realized that I fell into a way here of sustaining tension over and over and over again throughout a movie. And it was really cool to see how it it just kept rising and falling, but still building towards something bigger story. Yeah, beyond Final Heat, I know you have several projects in the pipeline, like uh, Full Tilt Boogie, Ava, and Psychic School. Share a bit about those projects and what audiences can expect from each of these. Absolutely. I'll start with Ava, because we just shot on that, uh, what, about two or three weeks ago. Uh, yeah, it's really fresh. And... I'm really excited about it. It's my manager who's also producing now, and he was our producer's rep for Final Heat. He's producing this movie, and he's directing it with Greg Beckers, and he's producing it with Zach Kep is the director. It's his second film, and he did Willowbrook, which was, uh, I think, a Gravitas film, and and this is his second venture, and... Yeah, really, really talented director, kind of inventive, wild ideas, very meta he, his lens is very cinematic it's movies about movies this one has a very sunset boulevard kind of feel kind of what's the one from the 40s 50s geez I, i'm blanking on the name of the film but another classic that's about an actress and her protege taking over for her that you oh. know it's got that really exciting classic cinema feel and uh, yeah it was shot Beautiful. It takes place at one location. It's at a mansion in the Hollywood Hills where a very established star actress trying to get her her baby movie done, her dream project done, and her assistant, who we come to find out is really, you know, manages her whole life and career and is kind of a, a really talented, aspiring producer, wants to be a producer, but her actress hasn't given her reign to take that step up. They try to do a sort of live presentation of the film over the course of a night. And it's set around and adapted around a book that takes place at a circus. So they essentially bring the circus to this house and they bring investors there and they bring their big producer, who's played by Michael Madsen, who was awesome <laughs> and very cool to work with to this house and and the night becomes a freaking circus and it's got that a little bit of feel like the square as well like a like a live you don't know what's real what's not real these actors that are circus performers are they really circus performers are they in character i got to play one of the circus performers it's kind of a dream come true kind of a thing for an actor because you want to just go out there and jump without a net you know they tatted me up i got like full tattoos all over my body got this really crazy mullet haircut and just kind of you know let the rip cord go and they allowed for a ton of improvisation on set so we're doing just these really wild kinetic scenes that you didn't know where they were going but they're a lot of fun so i'm very excited for that film to see where it goes it's going to look beautiful it's going to be really original and it's going to harken back to some classic cinema so I would really look out for it if you like indie film and if you like uh, 
you know, meta type movies. It'll be exciting. They're just starting post. So, you know, I don't know when it'll be done, but hopefully by next year or sometime, it'll be out there. True classic indie type film. Build Boogie was a pilot. I did late last year. We're playing on the festival circuit right now. It's very close to another wild role. This is the same theme here. I, I played it. It's about a sort of a pilot program that the government did back in the day for any sort of uh, neurodivergent type people, but particularly ones with psychopathic tendencies. They would find kids that were like this and they would swoop them up off the streets and these kids would disappear. This pilot was based off of a real story that this was happening. And so apparently they pulled all these kids to, or in this show, they pulled all these kids together and they raised them for nefarious governmental purposes. And many years later, the group of mutants it sort of has like the boys type of feel have broken out and they're kind of running rampant and they're trying to find them again and lure them back in stranger things a little bit of that so i played one of these one of these uh grown up you know kid mutants neurodivergence and that was a lot of fun too so it's played at a dozen festivals it's on a good run there psychic school you know i'm not as involved with i don't know exactly where they're at with that but that was another pilot that they created a friend of mine Created that, Talkisos, he directed it. I think that's his directorial debut. I had shot some other things with him in the past as him as director, sometimes with me directing. So it was, it was cool to support him on that one. Very cool looking piece. More of a dark comedy. Yeah, just like about a, a woman who realizes that she has psychic powers and she gets brought into this school, you know, this underground school for people with psychic abilities where they start to teach burgeoning psychics how to harness their powers and use them but yeah it has that like umbrella academy i would say kind of feel where it's a bunch of people with these special abilities they're all different archetypes of a psychic and come together and start to learn theirs but it's a it's a fun it's a really fun piece as well and yeah i hope they you know put do something with it as well I'm, like i said i'm not as involved so i don't know where they're going but very cool so yeah thanks for asking me about those three those were all super fun acting roles and projects for sure yeah no problem i'll have to look out for ava next year especially you mentioned the square my favorite movies but yeah i'll i'll keep an eye out for that and pull tilt boogie but i guess the only thing to ask would be you know what advice would you give new directors coming up in in the landscape now yeah totally i'm always hesitant with this kind of a question because i don't feel like an expert in any way I only have my own experiences to draw from, but sure. I could say that what I've learned or what I've tried to do is, is to start from a place of, of honesty with your filmmaking, with your own stories, you know, draw from your real life. Not that you're telling autobiographical stories, but stuff that's going on, that's the material for your filmmaking. It doesn't have to be, obviously there's people that do way different things, but but I do think, you know, if you're telling authentic, honest, truthful storytelling, that that type of lane, it's great to come from things that you, you are really dealing with and then and then explore them, you know, in, in the movie making process. So thematically, writing wise, storytelling, that's big for me. That's been a big thing, big theme throughout, you know, all of my films, Know Thy Enemy, The Shift, Final Heat even a ten the tennis film that I'm I'm developing have all really stemmed from that place. So I have a particular lens and I can get into a world. I think that's something I focused a lot on is I know this world really well authentically and I can I can take I can walk you through it. So there's world building in it. It's not Marvel world building, but it's a world that you maybe aren't as familiar with. And in its own way, it's going to be just as unique. You know, what can you express that people can watch and be like, oh, I've never seen that place or been there, but that feels real and that's interesting and I'm learning about it. So I start from there. I've worked a lot with collaborators that didn't necessarily, hadn't even done, you know, started, hadn't written or whatever it was, but had something to say. And, and we had together a common language. Oftentimes we were in acting class together or you know, we had started by making, you know, short films or we were athletes together and we bonded and it gave us material to work from. And then obviously available resources, you know, that's a cliche to say, but in any film, but it never fails. What do you have? What can you use? Build around that. 
I think everything I've ever done has massively had one primary location. Final Heat had a CrossFit gym that we were training at that was a big spur to go make the thing because we knew we could shoot 80% of the film there. The shift, we had a hospital. So these things are really, really important. And I, I think the big thing that I believe in is that you can do it by for now, because I, I think it's better to do something than to wait with some exceptions. You know, if you have an opportunity to get something huge, go ahead and, and, and do what you can while you can do it for now. And then you can do something again later and you can do something bigger. Even with Final Heat right now, I've been sitting on it for a while because we made it years ago. And then this whole process of turning it from a web series into a movie, I hadn't expected to do. And then I didn't have necessarily ambitions to sell it and to distribute it. But my very valuable, great friend and manager, Greg, looked at it and said, hey, what's going on with this thing? This is awesome as a movie. Why don't we try to sell it? And I was hesitant at first because I felt like it was an older piece and it wasn't a reflection of where I was at the time. But then I came around on the same idea that uh, you made a film and of what I was doing at the time that I was making it, which is what all art is. It's an encapsulation of that period of time. And it'd be better to, to finish it out, put it out there and have a movie film that I'm very proud of. <laughs> and I've gotten more and more proud of now that it's out there and I'm rewatching it. But, you know, that was just my own ego talking like I'm much further advanced that it's going to set you up better for the next thing that you do. So. Just do what you can while you can do it, get it out there and then make something else and make something bigger and you're going to have more resources to do it. So those are the things that I've learned and, and kind of use as my MO. And get in a writer's group. Like I said before, every day, every week, it gives you that foundation to come back to, to draw from. Yeah, I'll echo that sentiment for anyone creatively too, because I know having my community, whether it's online or local, has been a huge help over the last four years. If it's just talking to one of my critics groups, we've got a group chat going and we can talk about, hey, did you get that screener? Did you get that screener? Publicist for this, who's the publicist for that? Even stuff like that, even like a group chat is massively helpful. Getting, you know, interviews scheduled on my side, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, if you can find a community, whether that be a, a writing group or any kind of like-minded individuals, I highly recommend it. Uh, so if you're doing, yeah, just build a community would be my advice. And then maybe you get to hear things from people and you get those opportunities that you want. Maybe not like the big triple dollar sign opportunities, but maybe the the uh, $1 sign, you know, that'll get you to the double dollar sign and so on and so forth. But lonely and lonely working as a creative and it, it can be so healthy to have other people yeah. <laughs> in your life both for your work and for yeah especially as i go into tribeca it's been a huge help to have people to talk to about stuff i'm struggling with and stuff like that yeah it, find this find yourself community even if you're really not a creative if you, even if you're just like need friends that you know have people to talk to said jeremy i want to thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to sit down and talk with me virtually about your career and, you know, your career and everything that's gone on from start to, well, not finish, but to current day. Got a lot more coming up, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From your IMDb, you're pretty busy. So uh, I think people have got a lot more to look forward to. But with that said, if you're listening or watching, yeah, I'll have, let's see, let me try to do, do, do. yeah. But thank you for watching or listening. If you enjoyed this, let me know in the comments or wherever below the side, wherever YouTube or whatever platform you're experiencing this on, let's just write a little box, do it there. But you can follow me on social media at Austin B Media on Blue Sky, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, and Threads. It's a letterbox. I'm on there as Austin B Movies. Where can people find you on social media, Jeremy? Well, they can find the film that we have out right now on Instagram at Final Heat Movie. And that has a lot of the information about where you can find the film. The film is on Amazon right now, Apple TV. You can get streamers, but particularly Amazon and, and Apple TV. Final Heat is, is the name of it again. And me personally, my Instagram is, which is pretty much the only social I use, is Jeremy Jims. Jeremy G I M Z. And yeah, I'm on there. So please check out the film and 
you can find us on there. Nice. I'll have links to all the films we talked about today in the description. Wherever that is, click those links. Watch them, whether that's rent or buy. So, yeah. Thank you again, Jeremy. Thank you so much, Austin.